All right. So thank you, Sam, and thank you everyone for being here. It's such a pleasure to be back. Um, hi. I, I have to say, uh, familiar Linz. I love your icon. That is, I love it. the kitty. Um, Best, Eliza, Iroko, Jade, Jim, Ravina, Rishika, Rowan, Sarah, Shannon, Sram. Thank you all so much for being here. It's such a pleasure to be back. And um, we will get right into it and share my screen and we can get going here. <clears throat> Hopefully everybody can see and hear me clearly. All right, actually, let me do this because I think it worked a bit better last time when I did. I'm going to put my headphones in if my cats haven't dragged it off somewhere. I think you all were able to hear me a bit better when I did it last time. So let's go with that. What do you think? Sound policy better? Yeah, I think so. There's okay, a strange good. background noise though. Oh, that's Ooh, it. That's, that's fine. probably my, my space heater. One second, because it's a bit freezing in here. Did it go away? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, guys. That's my space heater because it's getting cold in Atlanta and I don't like it. But anyway, um, I'm glad to be back. Thank you all so much for having me. And today I will be talking about queerness and supernatural otherness in the writings of Akwaike Mezi, Eloko Salsundi, and Helen Oyeyemi. And as I said earlier, these are a lot of words to say that, you know, these writers uh, focus a lot of their narratives on the people who live on the margins of African societies. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing because as we will find out, there are some challenges to being on the margins of African society. But also there are challenges to leaving that position of marginality and coming to the center and we'll, we'll get into a bit of all of that. Um, and we'll, how we will do this today is we will start out defining who we uh, who I consider divine Africans and we'll explore some of the, the tension around that word divine because it, it carries a bit of a negative connotation. Um, so we'll go into that. And we'll look at divine Africans in traditional African society and folklore. We'll look at divine Africans in contemporary African society and folklore. And then we'll look at what I think of as the life cycle of a divine African, and we will highlight the, 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 the points in this life cycle with examples from the different texts and from these three different authors. And then we'll have a bit of a reflection about what this all means for you know, divine Africans themselves, but for the world in general. So defining deviant Africans, um, that something that is deviant or someone who is deviant um, is, uh, is, in, is occupying a state of, of differing from the norm, the acceptable standards of a given society. And this has uh, uh, a little bit to do with not being considered normal or not being considered typical. And there is usually this um, a negative undertone to it, right? And I. I struggled a little bit with using this term because you don't want to frame another person's different experience as something uh, as something negative. But I, I chose to stay with it because um, there is that that is a re reality for many people who fall under the classification of divines. Um, and what does it mean when you say someone is divine, at least in this talk? We're talking about the people who, because of mental illness, because of being queer, because of being differently abled or differently bodied are considered you know, not the norm within a given society. And as we will see in the African context, there tends to be um, a, a state of being supernatural attached to, to these things, which in our modern society, we have different ways of looking at and understanding, but the, the, the worldviews, the ways of seeing and understanding the world that many traditional African societies had would classify these individuals as being something other, being something supernatural, having some connection to the other world and um, that has its positives and its negatives as we will find out. So in traditional African folklore, um, a lot of the divine Africans come through and my favorite example of this is the Amphan Terib, which we have talked about before in a Romancing the Gothic talk back in, in February. And the Amphan Terib is a folkloric character from many different African story storytelling traditions. And they combine the characteristics of trickster, hero, villain, depending on context. Um, in the talk, which you can watch, there's a recording of it. 
and we classified unborn heroes in some different categories. So they are the, the destructive ones uh, who are just scales from start to beginning. There are the transformative ones whose presence, you know, there is destruction and challenge and tension, but it leads to a transformation in the society. And then there are the, the geniuses, the precocious ones who are just the incredibly smart um, characters who solve problems using unconventional means. And as we saw in that talk, they have a role of highlighting um, what, what is not working in a society or whether it's a crack or whether it's some contradiction. And um, even when they are destructive, they are, their existence uh, often leads to a revolution of some kind, uh, an improvement of some kind. And enfant terms are believed to um, originate in Mandinka, who are a people found in Mali, in the, those oral traditions, but they can be found in storytelling traditions all over the African continent. And the red dots here are where I was able to identify a story that features an enfant terms character, but I'm willing to bet that if we, we go deeper and um, search through more stories from all these other countries on the continent, we will find such characters in every single storytelling tradition. And it is my opinion that um, in most cases, especially the enfant terms of the precocious kind, uh, a manifestation of neurodivergence of people who are able to see the world differently and so offer solutions to problems that regular folks are not able to think about. Another type of deviant African are queer Africans, so these are people on the LGBTQIA spectrum. And what you will find is that in many African communities, um, well, there are some which are homophobic, you know, straight up, no if or buts about it. But in many, many African communities, being queer was often associated with being a supernatural, a supernatural state. Amongst the Dagara, who are found in Burkina Faso, gay and lesbian people are called gatekeepers because it's believed that they straddle, you know, both realms. They act as mediators between between the human and the spirit world, um, and they 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 have circles within which they move. They move rituals only they can participate in and ways of being which their society allowed them to be this way. So it was an othered state, but it wasn't necessarily a negative othered state. And you'll find this reoccurring in many different African communities. For example, among the Hausa, you have what is called the, the young the young Daudu or the sons of Daudu. And Daudu is a, a, a spirit from out of Hausa and in his beliefs. And um, young Daudu tend to be gay men. And they, they, the, the, the worldview that they embrace integrates Islamic as well as how the animist believes, a strong um, a feature of which is a spirit possession. So if you want to know more about Yandaudu, uh, African religions just did a fantastic uh, paper on this topic with references to more discussions that has been had on this topic. So there is a link to that in the references, which you can check out. And if you follow African religions in Twitter, that's a really good resource as well. But outside of the Dagara and the Hausa, you'll find that in other communities, queer Africans um, are associated with a state of being supernatural. So this occurs amongst the Ovambo in Namibia, amongst the Ila in Zambia, where the Mwami is a man who lives and dresses as a woman. And you have the gender mixing shamans of the Ondonga in Namibia. You have the, 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 the Chibadi, uh, the Chibados from Angola. And there is more commentary on the Chibados because it was noticed that on the ships that transported enslaved Africans to the Americas, these individuals were often leaders um, and responsible for you know, a lot of the resistance that you found amongst the, the, the enslaved and captured people. And among the Zulu in South Africa, you have the, the chief of women who are often Sangomas diviners um, who have these um, lesbian relationships but also occupy a place of honor in societies. And this is just a, a snapshot at the different ways in which this manifests itself in, in different African contexts. Um, there is the book, Boy Wives and Female Husbands, which goes into this a little bit more. There is also African Sexualities, a reader, which is a more nuanced take on the different ways in which um, sexuality manifests itself on the African continent. In contemporary African society and fiction, it's a bit different. And we will examine the, the occurrence of these deviant Africans through the characters in the three books that we, in characters in the books by the three authors that we, we are focusing on. The first is Jessamy, who is a character in Helen Oyeyemi's um, The Acres Girl. And Jessamy's story is that of a little girl who um, goes through this 
mental breakdown, for lack of a better way of putting it. She travels, she's Nigerian and British. Her father is British, her mother is Nigerian, Yoruba to be specific. And she travels back uh, for the holidays, as many you know, uh, people do, and encounters this entity, which she thinks is real, but it's really a spirit entity and who follows her back to, to England and causes so much havoc and turmoil in her life. Um, if you're looking at it through the, the modern scientific psychological lens, you might see that um, Jessamy is experiencing some kind of schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, but there are ways in which the Yoruba people frame these, these mental illnesses, if you want to call it that, or these ways of being. And that's something that I, I want to explore in this talk, because you, you have different ways of understanding how people are in the world. And one is not necessarily more valid than the other. The question becomes how do these framings enable people to live and thrive in communities? And what I have here is a quote from the book from when Jessamy's mother realizes what is happening to her daughter. And, and she, she says three worlds, you know, Jess lives in three worlds. She lives in the world, she lives in the spirit world, and she lives in the bush. And she's a people she would always have known. And this is in reference to something which happened in the book where um, Jessamy finds out that she was actually a twin, but her twin dies before she was born. And she found this out from Tilly Tilly, from Titi Lola, who is the, 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 the entity that has attached herself to her. There's, her parents have never talked to her about this. So there's a question of how did she know? And there are instances you know, in the African context and elsewhere where you have individuals who have this knowledge without ever being told, which spur, uh, spurn um, uh, characterizations and descriptions such as this. So there's Jessamy. There is also the Ada, who is a character in Akwai Kemezi's um, autobiographical, semi-autobiographical autobiographical novel, Freshwater. And um, the, the, it tells the story of uh, their movement from childhood and, and um, adolescence to the Americas where they go to college and how you know, they unravel into these multiple personalities and entities which basically take over them. And I have here a quote from Asugura, who is one of the entities who shows up in the in the other's life um, after she after she undergoes a sexual assault, and this entity shows up to protect her. And Asugura says, "I have arrived, flesh from flesh, true blood from true blood. I was the wildness under the skin, the skin into a weapon, the weapon over the flesh. I was here. No one would ever touch her again." And when you read the book, you will see exactly how Asugura goes about protecting the other by forging her into this, you know, formidable character who is able to meet any challenge, sexual or otherwise, that, that comes her way. And you witness the transformation when she moves past the point when Atugura is able to help her and, and, and brings in other potent entities who help help her and eventually them navigate life. The third book and set of characters we will look at are the vagabonds in Elogo Sawasunde's uh, Vagabonds, right? And we'll look at Gold, Fawn, Amenze, Kim, and F. And Vagabonds was released uh, earlier this year. And it tells the story not just of these characters, but of the city of Lagos, Nigeria itself. And that's something to note because in traditional African worldviews and many world and many you know, beliefs around the world, places have their own spirits, and these spirits have definite characteristics, and people interact with these spirits and, and they they do their actual implications in people's lives. So um, we, we will examine the, the manifestations of deviancy in these characters' lives and how they tie into modern understandings of you know, being other and existing in the world at the same time. Excuse me. So the life cycle of a deviant. Starting in childhood, it's usually fractured and tumultuous because this child is undergoing this, you know, way of seeing the world, experiencing all these different emotions and, and, and stimuli and perceptions and sensation. And quite often their parents are completely unequipped to deal with the demands. Um, and this sets the stage for that half here and half elsewhere existence because then the child has to rely on you know other ways to understand what is happening to them. Often they are not even able to communicate effectively what is going on with them. Now, what you will find is that in traditional African societies, there are ways by which people made sense of these, these otherness that would show up every now and then. Um, mentally ill people, queer people, differently abled or differently um, bodied people were, were, were designated you know, in different categories. And these were not always positive, to be clear. 
you had cases where differently bodied people were, you know, thrown out, murdered as babies. If you want to call it what it is, we have cases where um, if you if you had a, a, a if you were born with you know, a, a different way of perceiving the world. It was said that when your mother was pregnant, she had an interaction with a bush spirit who came into her body and that if you, so what you are now is a bush spirit. And that could really lead to a lot of stigma. Um, you know, I remember a, a case of um, a child who went, I went to primary school with who in retrospect now, looking at how she was formed and everything, this child had Down syndrome, but we, we had no idea how to deal with her and there was a lot of fear and stigma that happened and you, you, you reflect on this now and you, you think wow what, what what damage ignorance can cause and that that is the case in many of these contexts but the positive of it is that what what traditional worldviews would also do is offer a story a framework within which people can make sense of their life so if you are classified as the child of a bush spirit there are usually ways in which your community would relate to you, there was a path you would take, there were rights that you would go through, there were ways in which you would be treated, and for better or worse, again, which would, would you, you would be able to make sense of who you were in society. We see that in the case of queer Africans who, like in the case of the Dagars, were designated gatekeepers and there was a role that they occupied in society. And the issue is that in modern African society, there are multiple competing meaning-making mechanisms. There's a traditional worldview, there is the modern scientific, you know, psychological worldview. There is Islam, there's Christianity, and there's all these ways in which people who are differently able, differently bodied, uh, neurodivergent or queer can be described. And because there is not one way of looking at things, it can be very confusing for the parents, for the, for the individuals themselves. Um, but there is also opportunity here, right? Because um, in, in this, in this, the asthma of confusion um, with the right tools, with the right exposure, people are able to chart, you know, a course for themselves to, to make meaning for themselves. But this is often not without, not without a lot of turmoil, not without a lot of um, trauma that, would, that individuals will face. And um, one of the arguments I make and demonstrate with um, examples from the book is that when a society and a person's family comes forward with love and acceptance, then um, these deviant Africans are able to emerge from childhood with, with um, some measure of wholeness and stability. And we see this um, two, two instances in Jessamy's case and in the case of Gold and Fong. Now in Jessamy's case, um, even though her mother and her grandparents were able to understand things from the Yoruba perspective and her father and mother being you know, people who live in, the, in England, were able to send her to therapy. What I found was that at the end of the book, with Jessamy herself, you know, reconciling the different um, ideas of what was going on with her, you, you don't really arrive at this for me personally. I didn't really feel a sense of, okay, this child is going to be okay. And there is a hopeful note in how the book ends. And if you've read it, you probably know what I'm talking about. But you still leave feeling like, okay, I, I hope she makes it. You know, there, there's that suspense that you leave with. Meanwhile, in, in Vagabonds, there's a case of gold and so on. And what, what I will do when we talk about examples is that I'll just read short excerpts from the book. So in Gold's case, um, she's reflecting on herself and it, it goes, Gold was only still here alive because she had a mother who asked, what do you want for yourself, my child? And listened when she answered, after all. A mother who saw how on at home Gold was in her own body and asked, what is your real name? And then believed Gold immediately. Life is different with a mother who listens and believes, a parent who welcomes you when you take yourself home to meet her for the first time, who lets a dead name go quietly into the ground. Contrasting with the experience of Fon, who is another character in Vagabonds, the last time Fon heard her mother's voice, she was a teenager, terrified of losing God. But enough time had passed since the day her father had decided he didn't want a daughter whose heart could do wild things like love girls. And her mother had stayed silent, over his dead body, was he going to have a child with such a defect, he said, a glitch in the head, clearly not biological, clearly not from his side of the family. A disownment then, and why not? He was the adult, no? Adults do what they like because children can't say nothing. So out into the streets, go. So same country, same Nigeria, same general culture or experience, but two different outcomes. And the difference was that 
one parent chose to be affirming, one parent chose to be loving and to provide that safety net, and another, you know, chose to go with whatever beliefs was influencing their perception of their child. Moving into a dollar sense, as you can imagine, if you have that safety net, that love, that that um, um, um support, then you get to have as normal a, a child, an adult sense as can be expected, given that wider society is probably still very strange and weird. However, for many, many, many people who fall into this deviant category, um, these are the wilderness years as I think about them. There's rebellion, there's sexual exploration, identity crisis, substance abuse, and madness. Um, these are outward demonstrations. The flip side of it is that there is this folding into, into themselves, a masking, uh, a desperate attempt to appear as normal as possible, which in many cases, you know, backfires. And what I will do is read an excerpt from Freshwater, which is really one of my favorite books ever. And this is uh, the Ada speaking for herself, because a lot of the book is the stories told from the perspectives of the different entities um, which, which possess her. Um, and this is a case, this is an instance where the Ada herself comes, comes true. So she says, I don't even have the mouth to tell the story. I am so tired most of the time. Besides, whatever they will say will be the truest version of it since they are the truest versions of me. It is a strange thing to say, I know, considering that they made me mad. But I am not entirely opposed to madness, not when it comes with this kind of clarity. The world in my head has been far more real than the one outside. Maybe that's the exact definition of madness, come to think of it. It's all a secret I've had to keep, but no longer not since you're reading this. And it should all make sense. I didn't want to be alone, so I chose them. In many ways, you see, I am not even real. When they speak so contemptuously of humans, I'm never sure if they mean me as well. You have this madness, and if you read Freshwater and the rest of um, the other story, it's textbook rebellion, sexual exploration, massive identity crisis, substance abuse, um, and in some cases, you know, that falling into self, that, that trying to hide, which is never really entirely successful. Um, but also in adolescence, it's the beginnings of the attempts to synthesize meaning making mechanisms that, that fit into, into the reality of what they are experiencing. There's exposure um, um, to, to different ideas, different worldviews, which are, are not, you know, coming from the family or the immediate community. And, and this can be a good thing. In the case of um, of gold, which we will see, it's a conversation between her and a friend who um, we were talking about the fact that gold's mother represents so much more than just the parent. But let's look at one more example of that rebellion that that you know descent into madness. You have Amenze, who is a character in 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 uh, Vagabonds, and this is after you know a spontaneous sexual encounter she had with a guy. And she, she's thinking all she could hear in her head was, what exactly is your life becoming? A Chicken Republic stranger, Chicken Republic is a restaurant, I believe. Chicken Republic stranger. Her mother's voice, reliably judgmental, even in death. How would she explain herself? Explain that though she might not be above making foolish decisions, she would never have gone this far with this man if she had been in her right mind. Which mouth would she use to say that she was working on her own DJ only to be shrugged aside and ejected from her body? It wouldn't make sense. Amenza wriggled out from under Tunde's arm and told him to not call her again. She knew he'd try regardless because he looked like he would never recover from what had happened, so she blocked his number to save them both the stress. Whatever happened in that bed wasn't her own skill anyway. Now contrast this to Gold, who has had more positive experience in childhood with a protective mother. Gold chuckled, remembering the true thing F told her another time. In a place where people threw their kids away all the time for just existing, a parent who loved you because you were you would sometimes look and feel like God. But remember, F had said that even when their love feels divine, they are not God. They are your parent. It's okay if you still don't know what that means. I don't either, because I mean, you know how my story goes. We don't have many examples. But what is life for, if not for figuring out? Abby. F's voice shook when she spoke next. Your mom is showing you what else is possible. And even me, I'm learning from her. But everything still comes back to us. Whether we will receive that love or not depends on us. It depends on whether we think we deserve it or not. No one can decide that part for anyone else we get. It has to be you. It has to be us. In adulthood, 
stability and integration depends on the path that these individuals have walked through childhood and adolescence. As you can imagine, the more stable and affirming and loving um, the community was, the more they will be able to show up. But quite often what you find is that in the absence of these stable mechanisms, um, people figure out for themselves chosen family, whether in this world or another. And um, when, that, when that doesn't happen, it can lead to a very, very difficult adulthood experience. And we, we have evidence of that. Um, in Freshwater, um, at the end of the book, the Ada is coming to terms with her reality. And this is a bit of a longer excerpt. Um, in her case, she found, um, well, at this point it's B, because she has gone through you know, a journey in identity. At this point, they've found a sense of belonging with a community of people who understand them as they, they, they show up. And she is reconciling herself with her other community, of, her other community, her other family in the spirit world. And she says, it's, well, they say, it's hard to ignore a God word, especially one like hers. The message was so simple. I couldn't pretend to not hear it. Come home, my brother, sister, son. Come home and we will stop looking for your trouble. I bent my neck and raised my hands and submitted. What else was there to do? You cannot wrestle with your chi, your chi is your personal God, and win. With this new obedience, or in this new obedience, I decided to go back to Umuahia and see my first mother. I knew it would be impossible to close the gates, but I was a bridge, so it did not matter. If I was anything else, maybe I would have been uncertain and full of questions, looking for mediators, trying to speak to my ancestors. But I had surrendered, and the reward was that I knew myself. I did not come from a human lineage, and I will not leave one behind. I have no ancestors. There will be no mediators. How can, when my brother's sister speaks to me directly, when my mother answers, when my mother answers when I call her? Like a historian said, you know, you have to know your place on this earth. It was very hard letting go of being human. I felt as if I had been taken away from the world I knew. Like there was now thick grass between me and the people I loved. If I told them the, the truth, they would think I was mad. It was difficult to accept not being human, but still being contained in a human body. For that one though, the secret was in the situation. Obanje asked liminal as is possible, spirit and human, both and neither. I am here and not here. Real and not real, energy pushed into skin and bone. I am my others. We are one and we are many. Everything gets clearer with each day as long as I listen. With each morning, I am less afraid. My mother draws closer now. I can see a red road opening before me. The forest is green on either side of it and the sky is blue above it. The sun is hot on the back of my neck. The river is full of my skills. With each step, I am less afraid. I am the brother sister who remained. I am a village full of faces and a compound full of bones, translucent thousands. Why should I be afraid? I am the source of the spring. All fresh water comes out of my mouth. So an example of someone who finds family and belonging in an other world. And then you have the example of Kim, who finds belonging with another person. And this game is a character from Vagabonds. So this is uh, a conversation between her and her employer, Adura. <clears throat> you said you used to work for them. As what? Oh, as, as the houseboy, she said quietly. The silence spread as Kem held Adura's gaze, her eyes glassing. It was important, Kem felt, to stay wide awake to the possibility of mockery of a body lurching across the room with wicked hands, of getting fired. She'd lost enough to know how it worked. There was more than just a dead name, an abattoir and a sewing machine in her past. There was lost blood and billowing ashes. Okay, Adora said, communicating her understanding. She wasn't going to probe any further, but it all made sense. Everything was clicking into place now. In Kemp's reliability, her heart for Adora, her compassion, her ability to tidy Adora's day with the exact right question. Corn rolls for weeks, edge is receding. Ma, can I braid your hair? Shoes falling apart. Ma, can I help you buy new shoes? In bed for days. Ma, should we take a stroll? Not been eating. Ma, should I cook your favorite soup? Been smoking. Ma, should I spray air freshener? A vibrator. Ma, should I charge this thing? 
any time at all. Ma, what about your medicines? Gem knew all the right questions to ask. She knew how to make Adura feel safe, even when her life was unraveling and her mind was coming apart at the seams. People didn't grow that much compassion without first suffering tremendously. They got along from inside that void. Gem needed the big sister and Adura needed the younger one. Gem could enter the flat and move just from the sense and smell of things, whether to float the place with light or to allow the darkness to keep gathering. And in the same way, Adura was able to tell when Kem was having a hard day. Don't worry, don't cook today. Next time, here, one more, the transport. Here, I found this dress. I thought it would fit you. Finding each other was a miracle in that sense. There are two worlds colliding in that sweet then overlap where everything is possible. And so what I really hope I'm communicating here is that divine Africans or however you want to classify them, vagabonds or whatever, um, and humans in general provide insight into what happens when the liminal becomes the center, right? When people from the margins move to the center and there is a positive side to this and a negative side to this. The positive being that they highlight the gaps and holes in the community fabric, much like tricksters in folklore do. And the reaction to this is either the community rushing to fix these gaps and make sure that there's a safety net for everyone, or the community, you know, being affronted by the fact that they are being shown for being hypocrites, they're being shown for not living up to the ideals, and then turning that, 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 that uh, discomfort into violence on the people highlighting this. And that, that is a sweet spot and why I have so much appreciation for the work that these authors do, because in their writings, they are basically highlighting these issues and not just highlighting them, but presenting a possibility for a way forward um, by bringing together, you know, the, 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 the ways which things used to be, the way things are, they are, you know, creating a, 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 a framework for where things could be. We can have a world where uh, we, 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 we merge traditional African and other indigenous understandings of, of otherness, of queerness, of mental illness, of dif being differently abled and differently bodied, we you know understandings from modern science to to create an environment where people are not so othered. It's all in the story we choose to tell, right? Um, when a traditional society decided to say, okay, such and such a person because they're in such and such a way has this relationship with the spirits. I mean, it was an attempt to integrate this person's existence to reconcile the reality of their being. And as we talked about, it didn't always work out for the people in question. But it is, it is a way to do things which in our hands now can become you know, something that we use to, to create a world where people don't need to be tossed to the side because they are not like us. And I think that is, that is something that we desperately, desperately need in the world today. And again, why I have so much appreciation for the work that these authors do. So what lies ahead for divine Africans and women of all shades? I think that in a, to a large extent is for us to decide and we have these tools, we have this knowledge, we have storytelling as a very, very powerful um, um, way of doing things. And that, that, really is, that really is up to us. So that's what I have for today. Um, the references are here. I really, really recommend um, uh, the, the essay about uh, the, the, the Landaudu. This was recently published, so please give it a look. There is also um, the essay about gatekeepers in the Dadara tribe. Um, there is also the writings of Malidoma Somi and Tubonfu Somi, who are two elders and teachers from the Dadara people, strongly recommend as well. Um, and then, of course, the three texts that we use today, Freshwater, The Icarus Girl, and Vagabonds. If you have not read Vagabonds, please, please, please read the book. It is a breathtakingly beautiful book. Strongly recommend. And um, there is also this uh, a dissertation by Arya Tampuran, which I have not read. I've read the abstract. I don't have access to it. So if you have access to it, please share. Um, but it, it talks about the colonial approaches to reading distress, healing, and well-being in contemporary African diasporic context. And she does a similar thing where she, she uses writing from, I believe, Akwaike Mezi from um, uh, Isar Daily Ward and other people to show how these these writers have used you know traditional African and other frameworks to to make sense of mental illness and supply pathways towards well being that don't rely so much on othering other people. So strongly recommend that you read this and share if you have access to it. 
And that's what I have, friends. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Thank you, Sam. Um, and if you want to know more about the work that I do, um, I curate Mythological Africans, which is a platform for um, exploring worldview, spirituality, culture, and beliefs from different African peoples. Um, I'm Mythic Africans on Twitter. There's also the Mythological Africans uh, website, a one-stop shop where you can access the, the YouTube channel, the blog, the newsletter, um, and also other talks that I have given, including the Alton Terrible talk, which I gave with Romancing the Gothic. You can subscribe to the channel, you can follow the newsletter, and let's stay in touch. Yes, that's it. Thank you.